Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Dear ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our live webinar, General Data Protection Regulation 2018, How to Handle Personal Data. Here you will gain extensive information about handling personal data after the GDPR has come into effect in May 2018, as well as a live demo for the practical handling within the Docuber system. My name is Alexander Gruber, and I'm responsible for demand generation in Europe at Docuber. For all those of you who do not know us, here just a few words about Docuber. Docuber develops and distributes document management systems with the goal of easy digitalization of business processes. With both cloud and on-premise solutions, companies of all industries automate their administrative processes in order to lower their costs and increase their productivity. So far, worldwide, more than 17,000 companies are using Docuver. Our main topic today is the General Data Protection Regulation, or short GDPR, which has an influence on the handling of personal data worldwide as soon as the regulation comes into effect on May 25, 2018. This includes the possibility for authorities to impose high fines for violations against the GDPR. I'm very happy we could win Dr. Axel Michael Wagner for today's live webinar. He's a proven expert on this topic and will give you an overview about the highly important aspects and articles. Dr. Wagner is attorney at Peters Schönberger and partner MBB in Munich. His main focus lies on IT law, mergers and acquisitions, sales and supplier relationships, as well as questions about compliance and subject in legal proceeding at civil courts. On the subject of GDPR, Dr. Wagner has already led numerous seminars or workshops. Dr. Wagner is accompanied by Marcin Pichur, Senior Sales Director at Docuber and responsible for the countries UK, Ireland, Spain, Portugal, Poland, as well as emerging markets. Marcin Pichur has been working in the area of enterprise content management for 15 years now and has dealt with record management and privacy protection for a long time which makes him one of the GDPR experts at Docuber. Therefore, we risk it all this webinar, and now he will lead it himself instead of Hermann Wagner. Now, let's have a short look at today's agenda. First off, Dr. Wagner will give an overview about personal data before taking a deeper look onto the most important articles of the GDPR that have a direct relation to documents and communication in conjunction with personal data. After Dr. Wagner's legal overview, Marcin Pichur will show off to handle this data with the help of Docuber in a live demo. Like the topic, questions and answers about it are complex and various. So we hope you understand that for this reason, questions will not be answered during this webinar. For questions about Docuber, please contact infoline at docuber.com. If you are a Docuber partner, it would be the best to contact your responsible RSD directly. If you need additional information about the regulation itself, please contact Dr. Wagner's organization, Peters Schönberger and Partners, MBB in Munich. The common question about the availability of this live webinar, of course, the recording will be provided to you as soon as possible. After this introduction, I now hand over to Dr. Wagner. Thank you for the introduction, Mr. Kruber. Today, today we are addressing an audience that knows in principle what the GDPR is, from which date forward it will apply, and which sanctions may result from a violation of data protection law. Therefore, I will give lengthy introductions amiss, but nevertheless want to remind everyone that in particular in Germany, the topic of data protection is nothing new because much of what we can read in the GDPR has been in principle valid since the 1970s. In addition, there has been an EU regulation in place on this subject since 1995. Please keep in mind that although the GDPR will be directly applicable and enforceable in the EU as a whole, the following reflects the current GDPR understanding from a German perspective. To begin with, I would like to go into the key points of each data protection compliance management system. First, we have the survey phase and a risk analysis, which means evaluating 
what kind of personal data the company has in possession, how this data is collected, processed, stored, and passed on to third parties, and what the purpose of this is in each of those cases. So as a first step, a stock-taking exercise needs to take place. As a next step, each company needs to think about whether it is actually permitted to process the respective personal data the way it does, meaning whether or not the processing of each data and the purpose behind that is legitimate in terms of data protection law. Such a basis of legitimacy may follow in most cases from consent, from the underlying purpose of a contract, or from a weighing of interests. If the purpose due to which the company is permitted to legitimately process the data ceases to exist at a later stage, the data needs to be erased. If the purpose is changed subsequently, further requirements need to be adhered to, the details of which I will not be able to discuss here. Within such a risk analysis, it may be the case that the company previously processed data against or beyond the legitimate purpose or otherwise without a legitimate basis in terms of data protection law. In this case, there are two possibilities. Either, if that is in line with data protection law, the purpose needs to be expanded and accordingly needs to be communicated to the data subject in a different way when collecting the data, or the data may only be used less intensively than before or need to be erased at an earlier point in time and so forth. Now, in the context of what the company legitimately does with the personal data, it needs to ensure that the modalities of the processing are in line with the GDPR. This obligation of the company to produce proof of compliance, in particular towards supervisory authorities, is referred to as accountability. Thus, the internal processes and controls of the company need to be verifiably implemented and communicated internally in such a way that the company processes the personal data merely for those activities which are, as identified during the risk analysis, permitted. This is known under the catchphrase TOMS, Technical and Organizational Measures. Such TOMs comprise, for example, a concept for erasure, i.e. a process which, which prescribes when which data have to be erased in what way. The more technical measures can do in this regard, and the more guardrails it thus factually establishes, the less the company would need to invest in internal process descriptions and employee trainings, etc. In this context, we will later return to the topic data protection by design. Apart from risk analysis, from determining responsibilities within the company and from appropriate processes and controls at the company, every proper compliance organization, also as regards data protection, needs to document the processes and to review or, if necessary, to update the relevant measures. To begin with, the issue of documentation as taken up by the GDPR in the form of the so-called record of processing activities, in which all processing activities of the company and the underlying protection concepts need to be outlined. Further documents that are deemed to be needed to be established to demonstrate accountability relate to workflows, responsibilities, rationale behind decisions taken as part of implementing the compliance system, and so forth. Besides that, the GDPR provides for various rights of the data subjects. It is easier to understand why these rights actually exist when considering the data protection law as a regulation for a trust relationship. The data subject is the original owner of his data, not in a literal sense, of course, but in a figurative one, and as a trustor, provides this data to the responsible company, the controller in terms of the GDPR, which acts as a trustee of the data. We will look more closely into these rights of the data subject in a moment. Lastly, and this threshold applies specifically in Germany, every company having more than 10 employees which handle personal data on a regular basis, need to appoint a data protection officer 
who shall not only support and advise the company and its management with respect to data protection law, but who also needs to serve as a contact person for supervisory authorities. After providing you with this rough overview, let's take a look at the next slide. Data protection law is of course only applicable if the data concerned is personal data. The form, for example, paper, filing boxes, or digitally in computer systems does not matter in this respect. The decisive criteria is the particular information concerning the personal or material circumstances of an identified or identifiable individual. This is trivial and instantly understandable as regards the name, address, date of birth, shoe size, or suffering from cancer. But also the affiliation with a company, meaning that a specific person works for a specific company, constitutes personal data. And the same goes for that person's direct telephone number, email address, etc. Therefore, business correspondence, correspondence does in fact always contain personal data. This needs to be considered during the survey phase and the risk analysis that I mentioned earlier. The value of a piece of land, which has been put in brackets here as a striking example, refers to the indirect reference that the value of the property is relevant for the amount of the real estate tax to be paid by the owner and that the amount of taxes to be paid by an individual does of course provide information about this individual's material circumstances. So this is the reason why we have personal data here also. Another interesting question is also up to which point a person is still identifiable. This ultimately concerns all forms of identifiers and pseudonyms such as an IP address or the number of a driver or also encrypted data. The crucial point is always the question one, who has the mapping information, i.e. the information by which a specific datum can be mapped to a specific person, or two, who can obtain this mapping or information, and three, at what point does the effort which needs to be made to obtain the mapping information, for example, by cracking an encryption, become disproportionate, resulting in the respective controller not having the mapping, mapping information available anymore, so that from this controller's perspective, the personal reference of the data does no longer exist. This is certainly another topic which we could talk about at length. When preparing a risk analysis, it is also important to consider that people frequently do not only communicate with each other, but also about other people. For example, this would be the case if A writes to B that his father is suffering from cancer. These third parties are, of course, also data subjects within the meaning of the data protection law. And it is obvious that, for example, seeking consent from them in terms of data protection law is usually not possible. This issue is currently widely discussed by means of the example of the declaration of content used by WhatsApp. So after all, you see that it is often quite difficult to answer the question alone what personal data a company actually has, i.e. possesses or has stored in its computer systems, for example, in emails, in a document management system, and so forth. Let's move on to the next slide and get into our main topic for today, the rights of the data subjects. All data subjects, the data of whom are processed by the company, have in principle these rights of the data subject. And therefore, it is also important to assess during a survey phase and a risk analysis, what personal data of which data subjects are or will be processed by the company in order to identify the individual group, groups of data subjects. Before I go into the details of particular data subject rights, let me first tell you some general information on the topic. First of all, the data subject needs to be provided with information in a transparent way by the responsible company about who the company is that collects data, who the company's data protection officer is, what data is collected for what purposes, for how long, on the basis of which underlying legitimate interests, whether this data shall be exported from the EU, etc. 
Furthermore, the data subject has to be informed about the existence of the rights of the data subject, which I will talk about more in detail in a minute. For this information, the term privacy statement or similar is commonly used. According to the GDPR, this statement needs to take place at the time when personal data is obtained and thus not at a later point in time. The actual rights of the data subject in the narrower sense exist after data has been collected. We will look at some of these rights more closely in the following slides. At this point, I will, as I will not go into detail about them, I would like to stress the right to withdraw the declaration of consent and the right to object to a data processing on the basis of weighing of interests. By way of these rights, the data subject can, in specific cases, deprive the company of the basis of legitimacy of processing in terms of data protection law so that the company needs to review whether there are any other bases of legitimacy and if there are none, it needs to erase the data. Besides, there is also the right to lodge a complaint with a supervisory authority, as well as the right to be informed of severe, severe data accidents without undue delay, for example, in case of a loss of credit card or other sensitive data. The rights of the data subject need to be processed by the company within a maximum of four weeks. With regard to this deadline, there are only very few possible exceptions. Although the GDPR literally states only that the data subject is to be provided information about the action taken within the deadline, i.e. about the status of the process, experts tend to understand this to mean a deadline to reply to the request in substance. If the rights of the data subject are not dealt with appropriately, this may, as a violation of data protection law, result in the known sanctions to the point, up to the point of fines or claims for damages by the data subjects themselves. It is therefore necessary to establish an internal process at the company by which the identity of the alleged data subject can be verified and then the right claimed by the data subject is processed in a timely manner as well as in a manner that is appropriate in substance. Also, when communicating with the data subject about these rights, the provisions concerning data protection and confidentiality, as an example, are to be adhered to. This means that every communication with a data subject needs a safe transmission path. After this general information concerning the rights of data subjects, we will now quickly walk through some of these rights. On the next slide, we have the right of access to the personal data. In a nutshell, Upon request, the company needs to first confirm to the data subject that personal data of this data subject is generally being processed, if this is the case. Second, inform the data subject about the personal data that the company has stored. And third, inform the data subject about various metadata as set forth by the GDPR. I have briefly summarized this metadata into the categories origin, purpose, recipient, duration, existence of rights, and whether the personal data is being used as a basis for decision making. This metadata is partly of a factual nature, such as the question to whom this data was further transmitted, if this is the case, but partly also the result of a legal assessment, such as the criteria for determining the duration of storage. Due to this abundance of information which could theoretically be requested, the effort on the side of the company to identify this information can obviously reach a significant degree. Legislature apparently assumes that this data can be generated more or less at the touch of a button as they are believed to be stored in a system anyway. However, as regards the metadata, this is, of course, only the case if, for each personal datum, such metadata is specifically generated already upon collection and maintained thereafter. In particular, with, in particular with respect to the right of access, it is important to safely transmit the data to the data subject as the stored personal data itself, which could be quite sensitive, is being transmitted to the data subject. Let's move on to the right to rectification on the next slide. 
This is about the requirement of accuracy of the data. A prime example would be if the data subject has moved house, then his address data became wrong and needs to be rectified. The data subject informs the company about his new address, in which case the question as to a safe way of transmission for this sensitive information comes up again. But there are also examples for incriminating personal data, such as the number of enforcement orders which have been filed against a person, and which could be relevant, for example, for credit scoring. If the data subject challenges this number and requests, for example, to rectify this to zero, it is unclear on which conditions or upon which evaluation the company may assume that the data subject is lying or, in other words, whether he wants to rectify the data in a wrong way. It is important to note in this context that rectifying information within the company's systems is not enough in case the company has, in the meantime, transmitted this data to third parties. In this case, the recipients, in principle, need to be notified of this rectification and the identities of these recipients need to be provided to the data subject. This implies, of course, that the company has kept a record of the recipients of the data. A limit to this would be a disproportionate effort for the company. For example, the effort is likely to not be proportionate anymore if, after a managing director has resigned from his job, the company needed to notify each and every recipient of the company's letter paper, thus of every business correspondence on which the managing director is mentioned as such. The next slide briefly outlines the right to erasure. In this case, the data subject actually requests something which should take place anyway. If there is no basis of legitimacy for processing the data subject's personal data any longer, this data needs to be erased in any case, irrespective of whether the data subject requests this or not. Thus, we are dealing here with a right to erasure of the data subject to re-establish a state with it, which is provided for by the GDPR anyways, or conversely, with an obligation of the company to specifically examine once more whether there is in fact no longer a basis of legitimacy for processing specific data of a specific data subject in which therefore needs to be erased. A particularity here is, apart from the notification of known recipients, which I have explained earlier in connection with the topic of rectification, that when this data has been published, by which I mean disclosed to an unknown group of recipients, third-party controllers processing this person, personal data need to be notified. This is targeted first and foremost at search engines and operators of web directories, etc., who search published information and link to or copy these. The intensity with which the company needs to identify and notify third-party controllers in this case depends on the question of what is to be considered an appropriate effort, and this in turn shall be determined in accordance with the available technology and the cost of implementation. This provision is, as usual, open for interpretation, vague, and eventually cryptic, which is the typical style of the GDPR. Let's take a look at the next slide, the right to restriction of processing. For the data subject, this is about restricting or stopping the further processing. The data thus needs to be put on hold. There are two possible reasons for this. One, there might be a disagreement between the company and the data subject, and unless this has been solved, the, other, the further processing needs to be stopped for the time being so that no damage can be caused in the meantime. Secondly, it might be the case that the data concerned would actually need to be erased, but however, the data subject wants the company to keep it, but to prohibit access to the data. Concerning this specific data, the company in this case serves as, in simple terms, a storage medium on demand for the data subject. In any case, the data subject needs to be notified 
in advance before any restriction to the processing, irrespective of the reason, is removed. As a last point concerning the rights of the data subject, we have the right to data portability on the next slide. This ultimately only applies if the data subject himself recorded this personal data somewhere in a system, either on the basis of consent or on the basis of an underlying contract with a provider. A prime example here are social media platforms on which a multitude of personal data is piling up over the course of time, for example, a timeline, status posts, comments by the data subject, etc. This data is then stored in the system of the platform provider from which the data subject cannot easily export them, although he was the one submitting them in the first place. Therefore, the platform provider is obliged to release the collected works, so to speak, and the result needs to be provided in a structured, commonly used, and machine-readable and interoperable format, as if such posts would have been typed into a Word file on the cloud for years, and this Word file shall now be downloaded from the cloud storage. Finally, on the next slide, I would like to add a few details on the topic of data protection by design. This is also because this way I can lead over to the live demo. The goal of the GDPR in this respect is, in short, that the company as a whole shall, whenever it processes personal data, make use of a technology as data protection friendly as possible. This applies in particular to software that complicates a way of processing that is in line with data protection law, for instance, because it does not allow for the storage of certain metadata or for the erasure of data. Such software would not be sufficiently designed to support the company in adhering to the GDPR to the best degree possible. The decisive word here is a technology as data protection friendly as possible. And this depends, first of all, on what is available in the market at reasonable cost, speaking of the state of art and the cost of implementation. Of course, the state of art will naturally continue to advance, and the cost of implementation will hopefully go down further and further, and as a result, more and more can be demanded from the companies. The fictitious terminal point of this development is eventually a fully automated compliance with all requirements of the GDPR, virtually a sort of data protection artificial intelligence that automatically blocks all activities that would violate data protection law so that the company is no longer able to violate data protection law. But all utopian dreams aside, the efforts that need to be made by company always need to be seen within the framework of a weighing of risks. The more critical the processing is, i.e. its type, scope, circumstances, and purposes, and the larger the risks for the data subjects are, think of the processing of particularly sensitive data, the more can be demanded from the company when it sources hardware and software. And this naturally applies also vice versa. With that said, I hand over to you, Mr. Pichur, so that you can now demonstrate the progress of the state of art in the area of data protection by design. Thank you, Dr. Wagner, for, uh, for the first part, for the introduction. Welcome everyone. I hope you enjoyed the first uh, part conducted by uh, Dr. Warner, Wagner. And now I will just uh, share with you DocuWare's view on the on the GDPR, and then we will go to the live demo. Uh, can you change slide, please? Thank you. Uh, in DocuWare, we believe that GDPR is not a threat or a problem. This is a good business practice. GDPR can help entrepreneurs to manage, optimize, and streamline the customer-related processes. The basic question that we should ask ourselves, why would we want to keep outdated, obsolete customer data? Basically, we don't need such data. 
Let me give you my personal examples. We have a lot of partners today, some of the customers, some of you know me personally. So you know that I moved a couple of years back from Krakow to Warsaw in Poland. At that time, I duly canceled all the contracts regarding internet, regarding telephony, etc. But you will not believe it. Even today, I receive calls from internet providers in Krakow. They basically waste their time on trying to sell a service to a person that is basically not their target group. So again, in DocuWare, we believe that GDPR should not be perceived as a threat. It should be seen as an opportunity for the companies to manage their customer-related data in a better way. As we all know, certain document types, for example, contracts, invoices, correspondence, HR documents contain by their nature personal identifiable information. DocuWare can automatically classify such document types as contract, as invoice, as mail in or mail out as containing this personal identifiable inf information. More importantly, our artificial intelligence, IntelliJ, IntelliX, can help companies to automate this classification process and determine the person whose data is on the document. So in DocuWare, we believe that classification and metadata play important role in helping companies to comply with GDPR requirements. Once a document is indexed as containing personal identifiable information, DocuWare can automatically take control over the document to ensure proper management over its life cycle according to the GDPR requirements. So that means that DocuWare can impose retention periods to ensure that data are not kept longer than necessary. DocuWare can apply access rights to ensure that only authorized users can access documents containing personal identifiable information. DocuWare can apply appropriate access profiles to ensure that documents containing personal in information will not be inadvertently or intentionally emailed, downloaded, printer, printed, or otherwise transferred outside of the organization. DocuWare can track and audit any modifications to both documents and their metadata. DocuWare, DocuWare can provide audit trail what was happening with the document during its life cycle. Finally, DocuWare can store files on the encrypted storage while at rest, and DocuWare can encrypt the channel while the documents are during transmission. So we will shortly look at DocuWare in, uh, in action. And as you know, in DocuWare, we, uh, in DocuWare, we work with the company, Peters Engineering. Peters Engineering is a company, uh, Alex, can you give me the presenter rights? Thank you. I hope you can see my screen now. So in Peter, uh, in DocuWare, we have this company. The name of the company is Peters Engineering. As you know, Peters Engineering has been using DocuWare for many years. Peters Engineering originates from Munich in Bavaria. And I ask these questions basically during all my trainings, during all my meetings with the, with the partners. What is your first association with Bavaria? And I hear different answers. Some will tell me, well, Bayern Munich. The other people will tell me BMW. Someone else will mention, well, Oktoberfest, the beer festival. But in DocuWare and in DocuWare family, we associate uh, Munich with Peters Engineering. Peters Engineering is a mid-sized company. They employ 250 employees and they have been using DocuWare for more than 20 years now. They have just updated DocuWare to comply with GDPR. And I logged in right now as Peter Sanders. I'm responsible for sales department. And let me just log into the web client. And as you can see, we added a classification. Now every document that we store will be classified according to this classification scheme. So Peter works in the sales. That is why I can only see the classification for the sales department. Of course, I can only assign it to one activity and I have two classification options, uh, customer files on, or contracts. Then I have a different document types, delivery notes, proposals, purchase orders, and so on and so forth. And for every document type, we have defined retention period meaning that these documents will be kept in DocuWare for the period of five or 10 years. After this 
in the retention period has passed, Docuware will automatically delete these documents from the, from the system. Okay, as usual, Peter works with the customers and we receive emails and correspondence on a daily basis. And as Dr. Wagner said during his presentation, by their nature, personal identifiable information will be on the correspondence we are getting on a daily basis via emails. So that is exactly what is happening today. I just received inquiry from Thomas Rain. Thomas Rain works from Flyington, German, and he wants to get a proposal for a new roller coaster. Well, the policy in our company now is that we have to store it. We have to centrally store it in Docuware. So I just selected a proper configuration and I click store. Docuware analyzed and categorized this document for me. And in a couple of seconds, I will see that all the information regarding the company name, contact person, email address and subject were automatically populated. I may adjust project number, And uh, as you can see, the whole classification, department, activity, document type, it's all populated. So I can just click store. My job is done. Not only that, once we stored this document, we deleted the copy from our Outlook to make sure that we don't keep this information that contain this email that contains personal identifiable information in our Outlook. Now it's centrally stored and managed by Docuware. We got two other emails as well from Heli Iceberg. Heli Iceberg just informed us that she wants to come to Munich and sign the first contract with us. And we want to store these emails in uh, Docuware, obviously. So I'm selecting a store configuration and the same procedure. This is the first time we are storing emails from Heli Iceberg. So I will just copy the information regarding the company name. Uh, here is my, here is the contact person. And the project number is not there yet. So let me just populate this manually. Okay. All the other information regarding the classification is again pre-populated by the system. So I will not make any mistake when storing this document. So let me just store it. The first email was stored. Then there is a second email. Look here. All the information, all the metadata are automatically populated. We just train the system once and then the system will suggest the proper data for us. As easy as that. So I just click store. My job is done. We stored three emails. But as I said before, every email that we stored, every information that we stored is right now classified, which means that the Docuware will calculate for us the retention period. So what do we have here? We have a company name, we have a contact person, all this information that we populated, right? But if I scroll to the right, I will see that the retention date was automatically calculated. I just stored the document and the system automatically calculates the retention date, which means now, Whenever I get a call from a customer and they will be asking me which metadata on them, which information on them we are keeping and for how long we are, we plan to process this information, we will be able to give a very precise information. Now, as I said during the introduction, Docuware can be configured in a way that we will define appropriate access rights to the users. Let me open this drop down menu. Most of you are familiar with this menu, right? But look here edit option, print option, download option, all these informations are actually switched off. This document was classified as containing personal identifiable information. That is why I don't have any rights to uh, download this document or to take this document out of the system. I may only send a link to the document, but as we all know, this will require the recipient to log into the system and he or she will require the access rights to view this particular document. Not only that, we know that this email, this document, contains certain information. So we may actually want to anonymize it. How do we do it? As easy as that. We can just use our annotations in the system and hide certain information on a document. Depending on the access rights, depending on the user, I will or will not be able to view this information. So. Let me actually show you how it looks like for other colleagues in our company. As you know, this is not only Peter working in our company. We have marketing director, Fred Wiener. And Fred obviously uh, has access to some of these documents as well. Some of the uh, key contacts, some of our customers. So let me log in as uh, Fred Wiener and show you what we did for him. He has a simplified view. 
first of all, he cannot search by the uh, by the user, by the uh, person, right? He can search by the company, document type, subject, and so on. He cannot search by the full text. So we actually limited his access rights to the system. Not only that, once he performs a search, he will see the list of all the documents. And look here, he can see that there is a document originating from Frost machines, but he cannot see to which person it relates. Clicking on a document will show him the document in the viewer, but again, he has a limited view and he cannot hide the annotations. So he will see, he will see only anonymized document. So from the business perspective, from the process perspective, he needs to have access to these documents to take certain actions. But because he's not authorized to see who is the person we contacted, he cannot see this information. Not only that, we may have third type of users in the organizations, right? And this is exactly Simon Stone. Simon is our marketing director, so he has access to some of the information that we store. But for Simon, we created something else. Namely, Simon can retrieve the documents in our file cabinet document pool, but Simon does not have any view permissions. So he can see a company name, document type, so basic metadata about the document, but he cannot even look at the document. So we can make sure that the documents, once stored in Docuware, will be properly managed to ensure that users, depending on their profile and role, will have appropriate access rights to the document so that we can easily comply with the GDPR requirements. Now, as we know, Peter works in sales. And today we just got this inquiry coming from Flyington Germany. So Flyington Germany asked us to submit a proposal. The proposal is as good as ready, right? But this is a 13 million euro project. So I want to print it out and deliver the proposal personally to the customer. I want to discuss this proposal in a meeting. So what we are doing here, well, let me do it again, I'm clicking too fast. Uh, what we are doing here, we will be printing this proposal, but we will use Docuware Printer. Docuware Printer is very intelligent. For the end user, for Peter, nothing will change. He will go to the network printer, take the output, and go for the meeting, trying to close the deal. At the same time, Docuware Printer will intelligently look at this document, will read out company name, contact person, project number, subject of the document, date of the document, and other information that are mandatory, and Docuware printer will store it digitally in the in Docuware with no user intervention. Not only that, Docuware printer will classify this document as containing personal identifiable information. Docuware printer will uh, calculate the retention period and will impose appropriate uh, access rights. And that is exactly what happened right now. Docuware printer informed us this document has been successfully stored to Docuware. I can take the output, go for the meeting. So let me log into Docuware again. I went for the meeting. I presented the proposal to my customer and the customer said, yeah, we like the proposal. We want to close the project with you. So I put a document on a scanner and I scanned this document uh, to Docuware. But I received actually another letter as well by post. So I'm scanning this letter as well. So basically I will be scanning right now two documents. What will happen right now, Docuware uh, artificial intelligence, IntelliX, will analyze and classify these documents. As you can see this gr uh, gray label on a document, it means that IntelliX looks right now in this, at these documents. And in a couple of seconds, IntelliX will give us feedback. Green means I know the document, I was trained how to recognize it properly, and here is, the, here is my feedback, here are your uh, indexes. Red means it is a new document, please train me. And uh, yellow means I'm in a training process. Please check whether my suggestions are correct. Let me help IntelliX a little bit. Let me just repeat that process. And here we go. So we got two documents uh, that were analyzed and categorized by IntelliX. So let me store the first document. And this is our purchase order. So IntelliX shows us on the left-hand side the index values. And on the right-hand side, it shows us where the value was picked up from. So the company name was picked up from here. Contact person from here, document day from here, project number from here, subject of the document from here. Plus, IntelliX automatically classified these documents accordingly, so I can easily store it to Docuware. And there is a second document. IntelliX or Docuware see this letter actually for the first time. So we have to train IntelliX. How do we train it? It's very easy. 
You just click on the documents and the values are picked up. Here is my contact person. Date of the document was picked up correctly. There is no project number on the document, but I can actually assign it to something that already exists in the system. And the subject of document is actually in here. So I can click on it. My job is done. Again, the classification was defined correctly. This is a correspondence, in fact. This is not a purchase order. This is not a contract. So I can easily store it in Docker. So the documents were stored. So let's, for the last time, look at the documents, how they were stored in Docker. And we'll see that right now, here is my letter. All the indexes are consistently filled. Plus, again, the retention date has been automatically calculated by the system with no user intervention. And again, appropriate access rights were assigned to our documents. Peter's job is done. But as we know, May is coming closer and closer, and more and more companies right now are becoming aware of GDPR. So uh, that is why some of our customers or suppliers will be contacting us and asking us GDPR-related questions. And that is exactly what happened today. Heli Iceberg that came to Munich, we delivered the, pro the first project for, the, for her. She was extremely happy with the outcome of the project. She actually wants to work with us on a European level. You remember Heli Iceberg from Sweden. But before she decides to work with our company, with Peters Engineering on the European level, she wants to be sure that Peters Engineering is ready for the GDPR. That is why Heli will send following email to uh, Peters Engineering. Dear Peters Engineering team, please let me know which personal data regarding myself I am managed by your company. That is what we all can expect from May 25th. Our suppliers, our customers might be contacting us asking this, um, this very question. The email is sent. It was addressed to our administrator. So the administrator will receive the email in a second. And here is our email. Okay, he's not scared actually. He knows, okay, we are ready for this. So let's, uh, let's handle this request. This is clearly a GDPR request. So I will store it as GDPR request directly from my Outlook. I'm just clicking on the proper configuration. Now system looks at the document and suggests me all the indexes. So first name, last name of the person that sends the request, then status and all the other indexes that are mandatory. Okay, it was done. So let's store it in Docker. Relatively easy. The document was stored, the request was stored, and the system, Docker, again takes over the control and starts the process. What is happening in the first step? It's very easy. We will just inform Peggy, uh, we'll just inform Heli Iceberg that the process has started. Dear Heli, thank you for sending us your uh, request regarding GDPR. Our data protection officer has started the verification process and will inform you about the outcome in the next 30 days. Copy of your uh, uh, request is attached to this email. As easy as that. Peggy is actually, uh, Heli is actually very impressed. It was relatively quick, but still she waits for the outcome. In our company, in Peter's engineering, Elizabeth Cash is data protection officer. So let me change a user right now. And I will log in as Elizabeth Cash. Elizabeth works with Docuware on a daily basis. She may actually receive a notification that there is a new GDPR request that was sent to her, but she works, she logs into Docuware a couple of times a day. After she logged in, the system shows her there is a new task waiting for me. Elizabeth opens the task and she can see, okay, this is a GDPR request. So she has to verify this. The GDPR request has a unique number. In this case, it is 116. And the type of request is data access. So basically someone is asking for the data access. On the right-hand side, she can see the original email sent by Heli Iceberg. And now she has following options. She can reject this query, this request, and the system will suggest following answer. Your data are incomplete, we cannot perform the query. Of course, this is an sample. This can always be adjusted to the requirements of the customer. But before we reject, we actually want to perform a GDPR query. In this case, we'll be performing this query only in Docker system. But we can do the same query in third-party systems, in a, a CRM software, in your accounting software to check which other metadata are kept and managed by this particular systems. So 
I'm just clicking on the link, which is relatively easy, and now I have to uh, perform a query. So we know this is a heli iceberg, so I'm typing in, in a letter and the system suggests me a name, but I want to make sure that this is our heli iceberg and I know that she comes from the frost machines, so I'm just searching for a combination of these two metadata. Now, system shows me the result list and I can see, okay, this is heli iceberg coming from uh, frost machines. I can open the email, and in the viewer, I can see the original email, but the email was redacted as we know, right? But I would like to see what is behind it. Well, I have the access rights because I'm data protection officer and I can see the original email. Okay, there is a telephone number, there is a address and there is a first and last name. Fair enough, I can check, check the second email, what's on the second email, but the data in this case are exactly the same. Fair enough, in other systems, we did not keep the data of Heli Iceberg. So in this case, we will say, okay, let's confirm. Yes, we process your data, and now we will need to prepare the answer. So there is a second task. We have to define, do we don't have any personal identifiable information or Heli? But in this case, yes, we do. And which answer are we sending to Heli? Very simple, we have your email address, we have your first and last name, we have your home address, we have your mobile telephone, uh, mobile telephone. And we just confirming this. Now Docuware takes control again and Docuware creates automatic email that will be sent to Heli Iceberg. And Heli Iceberg will be informed via email, this is the result of your request. Thank you very much for your request regarding your personal identifiable information. We are currently processing following uh, information regarding yourself, email, first, last name, uh, home address, and mobile telephone number. Should you have additional questions, you may submit a new request form by using this link. As easy as that, Heli is absolutely thrilled about the outcome of the process because we were able to complete this process within only a couple of hours, uh, providing her a proper answer to the, to the question. So Heli will work with our company in the future. But these are not only suppliers, these are not only customers who might be contacting us with regards to the GDPR. And that is exactly what is happening right now. One of our colleagues wants to change his tax office. And this is our colleague Peter Sanders, right? Peter Sanders. For Peter, both for uh, employees and for our suppliers and for our customers, we created a web form. It is available on our web page and is available to everyone and everyone who has a GDPR request can fill out this form that will trigger process in Docuware. So let me just copy data into this uh, particular form. So here is my email address of Peter Sanders. And here is my uh, here is the content of the request. Dear team, please transfer all my pay slips to my new accounting office, Chatter the Accountants East in London. Uh, best regards, Peter Sanders. Okay, so let me copy this. This is the additional information, and Peter is asking for a data transfer, right? He may add signature. Sorry, my touch screen stopped working recently, so I just use my mouse. Yeah, Peter signed the request, and we are submitting this to our data protection officer. Okay, it was submitted successfully. And now I open the uh, web client of Elizabeth Ketesh and there is a new request. As you can see, the number of this request is 170. So every GDPR request will get its unique number. So we can audit this and we can provide audit trail in case of any uh, questions in the future. But in this case, we know it is about data transfer. So now we have three options. We can either reject it, we can process this, but this is clearly HR request. So I'm just opening this particular search dialog. And we are searching for the data regarding Peter Sanders. So here we go, Peter Sanders. And he asked us about his pay slips, right? So let's see if we have any. And here we go, we have two pay slips in the system. Now, before we transfer this information to his new accounting office, we can actually send a link or, or, uh, to result list directly to Peter, asking him to, to reconfirm that he these are the pay slips he wants to transfer. So we can send the information to Peter, please check. 
And once we get the feedback from Peter, we will be able to action. And as we all know, we can either use Docuer request to export the information, and Docuer request will export not only the metadata, but it may export uh, the documents as, as well. We can give the, uh, this information either to Peter or send it via secure channel directly to the, uh, to the new accounting office. During the short demo I was doing today, I showed you how DocuWare can help you with your GDPR-related processes. I encourage you to contact your partners, to talk to my colleagues, should you have any additional questions. Thank you very much for your time today. Alex, stage is yours. So thanks a lot to Marcin Pichel for your demonstration in the DocuWare system. And of course, thanks a lot to Dr. Wagner for the legal presentation about the general data protection regulation. And of course, thank to, thanks to all of you for attending this webinar. I hope you could gain um, lots of new information about the regulation and especially on how um, personal data has to be handled from my own. And if you have some questions about the Dockyver solution, please reach out to your RSD or contact us on um, the details on our website, such as um, infoline at dockyver.com. And for further legal questions, please contact um, Dr. Wagner's organization. Of course, we will provide the record of this webinar very soon. And on our website, you will find um, additional information about the um, new regulation. So thanks a lot and have a nice afternoon. Goodbye.